Hi, my name is William Malik. I'm the Vice President for Infrastructure Strategies with Trend Micro. We're here to speak about zero trust for hybrid cloud. In the course of this presentation, we're going to talk about some of the uh, security challenges that hybrid cloud brings. And we'll talk about how zero trust can help resolve many of these. Not, not all, of course. Zero trust is not a panacea. Uh, so let's begin with a uh, reminder. And that is no matter how much you put into the cloud, you are still going to be responsible for something. Um, there's a, in other words, an upper limit, how much you can outsource. And to illustrate that, uh, I would just share with you that my doctor told me recently that I needed to lose weight. And I said, how do I do that? What's the strategy? And he said, well, two things, eat less and exercise more. And I said, okay, appreciate that. Now, as an enterprise architect, I recognize before beginning on any such initiative that I always have to take a skills inventory and make sure that I'm paying attention to core competences and such. And I recognize that eating less, in fact, is a core competence and something that I can do quite well. Exercising more, on the other hand, is really not a core competence. And so I decided to outsource it. I send a check for $71 to my fitness club every month and I haven't lost one single pound. Those guys aren't doing their job. Well, the obvious fallacy there is you can hire somebody to take care of something, but it's still yours. And the purpose of this chart is to remind us that no matter how little or how much you do with the cloud, there are some things that still remain. So let's get into the core of our talk, how zero trust can help, what it poses as opportunities for hybrid cloud. Um, you've seen talks about zero trust before. I'm just gonna highlight a few important points that'll bear on this discussion. The cloud has no perimeter. There is an inside and an outside, but merely being in one of those zones does not automatically give you or deny you certain privileges and rights. There has to be a source of trust and you must assume a minimal need to know. That is, each user, each act, each service is going to have to authenticate itself, validate its uh, identity and its reason for being in that environment. We're going to ask that you deploy multi-factor authentication for any tasks that are critical. Uh, we certainly want to go beyond static passwords. We're going to maintain careful logs, and we're going to look at them. We're going to review them. Ideally, we'd incorporate those with technologies to correlate events happening in the cloud environment with events happening elsewhere on the network, uh, on your endpoints, and so on. Uh, that's another discussion. And we want to rigorously maintain separation of duties. The uh, painting here is from uh, Joshua at the Battle of Jericho. Uh, this is a reference to the Jericho Foundation, which was set up in the late 90s with the explicit mission of telling information security people that there is no wall. The walls will come tumbling down. In fact, they already have. And so we need to use something instead of a wall. And that gets us into the kinds of problems that hybrid cloud has and which ones zero trust can help with. So here are some pain points. The first one, audit and governance, doesn't seem directly to relate to zero trust. It does in that by having a careful record of who uses what resources and how they go about accessing them and what they do with them, you now have a very robust set of data from which you can derive audits. You now can validate your assumptions about governance of activities in the cloud. From a DevSec Ops perspective, the functions of change and release management, which are in fact quite uh, traditional, you may be familiar with the ITIL, the IT infrastructure library set of publications that talked about key functions for running a data center. That's still there. DevSecOps does not eliminate them. Agile is not just a new word for scope creep when it comes to planning. We still have a goal, we still have something we want to do. We may change course on the way there, but we know when we're done. 
So you have to keep that discipline in place. Information security, specifically identity management, which is foundational for zero trust. The problem of shadow cloud and the problem of garbage collection, which I'll get into in a few slides, those remain and those are particular to the hybrid cloud environment, knowing who's there, knowing what resources you're actually using, being aware of any resources you didn't intend to use. Next, con contract administration and procurement. Uh, you're gonna wanna make sure that you're buying what you think you're buying and that you're paying the right price for it. Uh, that gets into the issues of performance and capacity management, uh, monitoring uh, of utilization, monitoring of system events. Uh, some people may say, well, gee, cloud's elastic, so I don't really have to worry about uh, capacity management. Well, you do, because if an application goes a little loopy, it's going to consume a lot more resources than you want. So you need to be careful that your cloud is doing the right uh, things with the resources you intend to give it. Uh, and finally, just a side note about skills management and organizational change. If your organization has decided to save money by moving to cloud, you're gonna be downsizing your physical footprint. You're gonna be getting rid of some technology, either handing it over to an outsourcer or actually shutting down a facility. The problem is that your people are gonna be aware of this at the same time. And since the mantra of cloud is replace um, capital expenditure with operational expenditure, it's a fairly short path of reasoning to go to the individual who feels that maybe my salaried position with this company is gonna be viewed as an increasingly large investment and expense over time. The fact is employees do get more expensive over time. The cost of benefits go up as you provide raises and increases and promotional increases. Those costs will tend to increase over time. So the feeling may arise that perhaps, you know, now we've gotten rid of the hardware, maybe they're going to start downstaffing and replacing full-time people with their immensely wealthy, important body of knowledge on procedures and standards and how things actually get done. They're going to replace them with contractors, and that can be a significant challenge. Preserving the integrity of your organization, its culture, and its values as you go through, through these transi transitions is crucial. So, when you look at the challenges of going to cloud, uh, on the far left, you have the cloud native application, the everything new will be cloud, and you have cloud workloads, everything's gonna be running in containers or maybe serverless. You'll be using storage that's at, uh, accessed via the network. Where does zero trust fit in this? Well, right smack dab in the center of your DevSecOps development cycle. In some instances, the SEC is silent. Don't let that uh, mislead you, the SEC is important. We wanna be able to ensure that what's being done to the cloud is being done by the right people at the right time for the right reasons. We wanna make sure that the applications that are being assembled, some of which will include stuff that's built in-house and some of which will include technology that you'll be purchasing or leasing from vendors and some of which will be technology that you'll be downloading from repositories, open source technologies. You wanna make sure that that software supply chain is protected. And one good way to do that is to set up a zero trust infrastructure so that your networks are being properly monitored, that your users are being authenticated and that technology that comes on board has been vetted. Now on the right-hand side, you've got an organization that is using cloud along with everything else and they're striving for operational excellence. Now I've given a talk on that and I've written a paper on that. But here what we wanna focus on is that when it comes to improving the efficiency of your IT operation, documentation of procedures and making sure that you're applying governance properly is crucial to your success. Now I helped write parts of the COBIT version three standard back in the late nineties, early two thousands. And that model for the organization of a data center is just as well applicable to a distributed and heterogeneous environment involving hybrid cloud resources and other uh, business partners. What you wanna make sure is that the individuals that are touching your stuff are the people that they should be, that they're vetted, that their permissions are correct, that their actions are being observed. 
And regardless of which cloud technology you're using, whether it's Azure or AWS, uh, VMware capabilities that you're bringing up in-house, you want to remain aware that there is going to be some stuff that you will still have in-house. It's not going to be a flat one step to the whole new world. You will be doing hybrid environments, and you'll need to make sure that your information security architecture, which would include zero trust, has the span to cover all of those environments. Your endpoints and the endpoints of trusted partners, your networks and the networks you rely on, your sources and the data sources you bring in from outside, all should be uh, protected. Which brings us to one of the most important uh, vulnerabilities, and that is shadow cloud. Shadow cloud is cloud that you get when you didn't even know you were getting it sometimes. It's cloud that didn't go through normal uh, procurement, but it's the norm these days. Shadow cloud, think of it as like shadow IT, or if you will, shadow OT. It's when someone somewhere doesn't have the time or interest in going through a formal procurement process. And because the technology is so inexpensive, they just go ahead and get it. Or even worse, they pick up some service and they're not even aware that this service implies they now have a piece of cloud. Uh, you want to do something with iTunes and the next thing you know, you've got an iCloud account, right? You don't even know it's there in some cases. The important point about shadow cloud is even though it may only be there for a little while, it can serve as a platform for attacks. It may be there intentionally because you knew it was gonna happen when you bought this thing and you made securing it part of your plan. It may be there as a side effect or accidentally, you didn't know it was coming, you didn't uh, plan for it, but it makes sense that it did, or shadow cloud may represent an attack. Zero trust will vet the resources that come in it will monitor the capabilities of the technologies you're using. And when something unfamiliar shows up, it will throw an alarm. Most important point about hybrid cloud is we still must remember that misconfigurations are the top security risk. Very important point, can't be said enough. When you create a cloud service, when you bring up a cloud instance, when you attach cloud's um, storage, it is perfectly secure at the moment of its creation. Only you can access it. In the course of the process, from when you brought it up till when it gets moved into the production environment, many other people are gonna have their hands on it. And someone somewhere along the line may have made a mistake. And believe me, it's not because they don't know what they're doing. It's because this stuff is really, really complicated. We're talking about 500 or more separate options that have to be correctly configured to preserve what's going on in the cloud with regard to who can access it. If you look back over the past four years, you will find maybe three instances where a cloud vendor did something that inadvertently exposed customer data to the internet. All the other misconfigurations, all the other instances of data loss, those are all the result of some overt act that somebody took thinking they were doing the right thing. Now, zero trust can help with that to the extent that it will make sure that if there is something happening and it notices data exfiltration, it might be able to throw an alarm. Your network infrastructure should keep aware of things like data exfiltration and network segmentation, as we heard earlier, is in fact a fundamental requirement for an effective zero trust environment. So you have to have your instrumentation correct around your network. Now, this last point is somewhat complex and unfortunately zero trust can't do much with it, but I wanna bring it up because you're working with cloud and this is on the horizon. As we get into 5G, and as we begin to deploy more and more services, and I'm not talking about the stuff that's being advertised now, I mean the real full-blown 5G RHEL 18 from the 3GPP, which doesn't get finished until the end of 2023, which doesn't turn into products that are fully functional until 2024. In that world, the applications you run are going to be running in virtual environments. The connectivity is going to be over the standard internet, not over a proprietary link owned by a phone company. 
As you create and use these various applications, that environment is not static. It'll be brought up, put in place, and then if you move to a different location, that environment will be torn down and reconstituted at the new place. Here's the issue. As you bring up and tear down all of these virtual platforms, you will be consuming resources in the metadata, the counter that tells you what's the number of the next space, the pointer that tells you where the next group of storage is to come from. Those fields, those counters, those pointers, those tables are themselves finite in size and they roll over. If you're thinking, well, this sounds like Y2K, you're right, it is like Y2K. And we've seen instances recently where cloud environments have been impacted because counters have rolled over. It happened with some Cisco networking devices last year. It happened with some HP storage devices last year. It even happened to some 767s that were grounded in China because their clock said that it was August of 1999 because a counter that was tracking the date rolled over and the planes were deemed not airworthy because they were providing insufficient information. Now, what Zero Trust can do is it can provide a context against which you could say, okay, is this a malicious actor? Is this something going terribly wrong? Or is this a code defect or an architectural problem? And it will be able to help you filter away the noise so you can jump in and solve this problem. But the wider issue of using zero trust comes down to the following set of recommendations. From a high level, I would encourage you, first of all, verify then trust. That's what zero trust means, basically. I've got to know you are who you say you are before you're going to get access to those resources. I've got to make sure that you have the appropriate permissions and that the environment for which you're coming is trustworthy. You want to, in the second point, know your limits, know what boundaries there are, know what thresholds you can't pass, and make sure as you accelerate towards your digital transformation or move more rapidly towards cloud first, you don't run out of something important on the way. And finally, preserve the good processes you've built over the past decades in maintaining an effective, efficient, productive IT environment. It's not going to get simpler. It's getting more complicated. But an effective zero trust platform can make your hybrid cloud journey much more safe and secure, reliable. Here are some references to the material I've talked about. The paper discussing uh, garbage collection is first. Um, at that point, I'd like to say thank you for your time and attention. Enjoy the rest of the session.